The story opens in a hallway where a man named Mr. Aziz stands gazing out. A palace guard approaches him and asks how long he has been there. In reply, he says that he couldn't sleep, so he has been walking for a while. He tells the guard not to worry because he will be in soon. However, the guard hesitates and walks closer, saying that now he thinks about it. The stars look especially high today and the weather is pleasant. Mr. Aziz agrees and mentions that this is why he enjoys walking. He recalls a legend related to Venus. He shares that when Venus shines as brightly as it does today, the reincarnation of the goddess Ishtar appears to save the one who will become the greatest sultan. The guard replies that the story seems a bit far-fetched, and Mr. Aziz agrees that it is difficult to believe, but that is why it is considered a fairy tale. He adds that he is still waiting for the reincarnation of Ishtar, who is said to have a beautiful soul. In the next scene, we see a luxurious room where a person, wrapped in a dark cloak, sneaks about. She eventually reveals her face when she has to look in a mirror. This is our female lead, Jin Sehi. Looking at her reflection, she finds it difficult to believe what she sees and doubts whether she is really the person before her. She cannot understand how this is possible and pinches herself, thinking it might be a dream. However, when she feels pain, she realizes it is definitely not a dream. As she continues to inspect her reflection, a man approaches her from behind. He pulls out his sword and states that he recognizes her courage for entering his room alone. Startled, she turns around, and the tip of the blade comes under her chin. The man demands that she tells him who she is. In fright, her brain scrambles for an answer as she wonders when he woke up. This man is the second prince of the kingdom of Ashtal, the governor, Solomon. Moving ahead, he tells her that it seemed strange because, unlike usual, he slept soundly. Then he accuses her of giving him some sleeping pills. When she doesn't respond, anger builds within him. On her part, Say he watches the tip of the blade, contemplating how she might explain herself. The unexpected situation of the second prince waking up alarms her, but... This is odd, but right now she is more worried about his loose flaps. In such a dangerous moment, all she can think about is that he needs to fasten them a little. You can't really blame her when she's got a full view, considering he caught her off guard on her knees. Completely oblivious, Solomon continues speaking... He tries to interrogate her by asking for her mission and speculating if it was the annoying noble council elders. She shakes her head in disagreement because she knows that he is absolutely mistaken. She doesn't even know how to explain how she ended up here. Solomon leans down to match her level and tells her that she wouldn't get away by pretending not to know what is going on. Furthermore, he warns that the crime of entering the royal dormitory without permission is serious enough that he would have no problem cutting off her head right now. Fearful, she leans back as the tip of the sword draws closer to her neck. She thinks that facing death at such a young age feels unfair, especially after having died unexpectedly in her past life. She decides that she does not want to die in vain. Suddenly, the second prince notices a collar around her neck and it surprises him. He touches it for closer inspection and declares that the symbol on the collar signifies that she is the property of the sultan. He muses that this must be a joke from his mother rather than a scheme from the nobles. After a pause, he smirks knowingly and asks if she passed by there in the middle of the night. She gets confused initially, then her face flushes with embarrassment as she realizes what he is suggesting. To her, such an act is impossible, and she shakes her head in disagreement. Finally bored, Solomon comments that it appears she has no intention of speaking. He concludes that since she won't talk, he has no choice but to drag her to a torture room. She looks up at him in shock, wondering if she heard wrong. A torture room? She starts to picture being subjected to something horrific, like being strapped to an electric chair as she watches in the movies, though, of course, there are no electric chairs in this era. She resolves that if she doesn't say something, she might be unalived. So, she works up the nerves to explain herself, but all that escapes her lips is a meow instead. In shock and horror, she clamps her mouth shut, and Solomon gapes at her in disbelief. Meow? Seriously? He struggles to comprehend what just happened and finally decides that she must be crazy. On her part, Sehi turns away in humiliation. 
She wishes she could take back that embarrassing outburst, feeling like she might evaporate from the shame. Yet still, she thinks to herself that she doesn't want to die. No matter what she says, the second prince will not believe her, given that she is just an ordinary person who has lived an uneventful life. To help us better understand this story, we would have to take a little trip back in time. Just a little one, I promise. Now, it is said that life is a series of unforeseen events, yet something this absurd could hardly be expected. This new scene shifts to a busy marketplace, where some traders chase after a cat that has terrorized numerous people by stealing from them. The cat darts past legs and stalls, but eventually it gets cornered as the three traders finally catch up to it. They mutter curses as they lament how quickly the little creature is. One of the men decides that the chase ends here. However, this cat has a mind of its own, and it hisses in protest. In its mind, it feels offended that these three big people have been running just to catch a small cat. It hisses again, firing unimaginable offensive words at them in its mind. You might be wondering how a cat can be this sassy, but this is no normal cat. It is, in fact, our female lead, say he. She mocks the traitors in her mind and raises her paws to flip them the finger, only to realize that cats don't have fingers. This kind of humbles her, and she pretends to act meek and pulls off a sad expression. One of the traders starts to fall for her act, but another insists they shouldn't give the cat a chance to escape. The first man argues that the small and cute cat should be let go, but the one in the middle refuses. He reveals that a superior claimed this cat would reveal the truth to the governor. He points out that cats with white fur and different eye colors are incredibly rare and insists they take advantage of this opportunity. Meanwhile, Sehi plans to use the situation to her advantage. Spotting a low wall behind her, she prepares to jump, confident that she can clear it. As the traders continue to argue over what to do with her, she spots a box beside the wall and uses it to boost herself up. She is sure that jumping over the wall will be easy, and as she makes her leap, the trader in the middle tries to stop her, but she soars upward, victory tantalizingly close to her fingertips. As soon as her paws brush the top of the wall, she realizes that she didn't make the jump. She begins to fall back slowly, and she sadly watches victory slip from her fingers. Um, pause. In one last desperate effort, she cries out for help needing to escape, but all that comes out is a meow. In the next scene, we see a dark room where the cat has been caught and put into a cage. Say he growls angrily at her captors, and one of the men watches her uncomfortably, asking his colleague if it's normal for a cat to still be upset. The man in red replies that whether she is upset or not, she should be ignored. At this point, our female lead comes to the brink of tears as she wishes desperately for freedom. She wants to explain that she is not a stray cat, as they think, but is, in fact, a human. Once upon a distant memory, she had woken up one morning without worries and thought about how beautiful it was to live a life like hers. That day, she decided that it would be a waste of time to lose at a game she was playing, so she prepared to challenge herself to discover everything she had up her sleeve. It was a game about a man who loved only one woman in his entire life, even though he had a harem. She got ready to bring some snacks before starting, and at that moment, her eyes began to glaze over, and she clutched her chest. Unfortunately, that is the last memory she has of her home world. Suddenly, and without warning, her life was taken away, and she lost everything. Her one and only family, the only one she had, Maru, her cat, had cried out when it sensed that something was wrong. She had told herself then that even if her life was over, someone must take care of Maru. Presently, in her cage, she wakes up, realizing that she had fallen asleep for a moment. She wonders how long she has been trapped here as she listens to the sound of other cats howling and crying around her. She notices that they are covering the sound of Maru's crying that rings in her mind. Living on the street for the previous week had been very tiring, as she had to fight for her meals and struggled with other cats. She suddenly feels that perhaps it is a bit safer to be imprisoned in this cage. Suddenly, she recalls a conversation she overheard between the traders when she was captured. The man in red had said that the sultan had become overcome by the desire to own a cat, which led to his decision to go cat hunting. 
At that moment, Sehi begins to plot. She decides that though she doesn't know what is happening around her, she is sure her life will become better if she becomes the Sultan's cat. She tells herself that she would do it. She would make the Sultan her subordinate in order to live a life full of luxury forever. Not only that, but she begins to imagine a luxurious life as a cat where other strays would be jealous. Likewise, she makes up her mind to fulfill this dream as she curls up quietly in her cage, her mind racing with plans. Several moments later, she perceives an aroma. It is a delicious smell, which means that there is well-cooked meat nearby. A man appears, holding a piece of meat, and is surprised to see that she has woken up as she drools hungrily at the meat. He asks her if she wants some of it, and her eyes sparkle in anticipation. She asks for it and pleads hungrily in cat language. The man seems to understand and laughs, telling her not to dream about it because the meat belongs to him. He urges her to try to get it if she wants to eat it, which upsets her. She is unhappy that people make fun of her just because she is a cat in their eyes. Another voice announces the presence of a newcomer, and it asks the man what he is doing by the cage. The newcomer adds that a woman named Evelyn has arrived. The news seems to scare the man, and he hurriedly drops the meat in the process. He explains to the voice that he was just messing with the cat. On her part, Sehi only cares about the free piece of meat that has just fallen. She reaches out, wondering what kind of delicious meat it is, and determined to find out. She stretches her hand and comes a bit closer to grabbing it. As her body angles forward to help her grab it, a man walks up to the cage and casually steps on the meat. It shatters her at the sight of her precious piece of meat. The man speaks distastefully, dating that he cannot believe that the place is full of garbage on every side. Inwardly, Sehi bristles with anger. This man just called her food garbage after stepping on it, and she mentally calls him a bastard. He leans forward for a closer inspection, asking someone if this is the closest cat to the aforementioned description. Before she can manage a blink, she's snatched up out of the cage, and she looks around in confusion. The man calls her a piece of trash, hoping she turns out to be the legendary cat. She tries to fight him, taking offense at being called trash and wondering why he would dare say that. However, he reluctantly agrees that she is the only cat they could find with different eyes. Satisfied with all inspections, the man announces that he will be taking her and leaving. This news comes as a surprise and quickly turns to excitement as Sehi realizes that she has been chosen. In a carriage, she thinks to herself that it's a good thing they released her so quickly. Because now that she thinks about it, she still doesn't know what they want from her. She could end up being just a sacrifice. A voice announces from outside that they have arrived and it's time to get down. As the door opens, the sight in front of her is fascinating. It's a massive building that seems to glow with gold. A lady tries to coo at her, telling her not to be afraid and to come to her. But all say he can see is riches upon riches. She wonders if it is real and if she is dreaming because she had never imagined it would be like this. Suddenly, she spots a red diamond and recalls that it is considered the most expensive gemstone. As the lady tries to pick her up, Sehi jumps down and sprints away. Despite the beauty of the surrounding scenery, she doesn't know what will happen to her as a cat. She doesn't know when she will be used, so it's better to be prepared. She decides that if she takes care of things now, she won't have to worry about anything later. Likewise, she races towards the pillar, where she had earlier spotted the red diamond, and decides that if she can get it, she would find a way to return to her original world. Her road may be long, but she would never humiliate herself by living on the streets again, barely scraping by. She prepares herself to climb the pillar and takes a leap. However, she is still very young for a cat and slips back down. The women around watch her in fascination, thinking to themselves that she looks adorable. Ironically, she's actually fighting for her life. Just then, a man walks forward with a smile on his face. He thinks to himself that she seems to be an interesting kitten, and of course, the promised cat. Mr. Aziz says he is glad to finally meet our female lead, who, by the way, is still a cat. However, she is still lost in thought due to his mention of a cat of prophecy. 
His companion asks if he is sure that she is the right cat. He whispers that she looks just like a dirty and scruffy cat. Say he recognizes him as the man from earlier who had stepped on her meat, and she angrily growls at him. The man ignores her and continues to whisper suspiciously until Mr. Aziz announces that he is pretty sure she is the promised cat. He names her the incarnation of Ishtar, the enforcer of the goddess who will defend the new sultan. Once he picks her up, he apologizes for the late introduction and introduces himself. He tells her that he is the priest of the palace and that he has been waiting for her. All the words jumble in her head as she tries to make sense of what is going on. The priest continues speaking to her, fully expecting her to understand. He says it's not something they can discuss outside, so they can take the conversation slowly indoors. At this point, Sehi suspects that the priest knows she is human. She wonders what is really going on. As they walk, Mr. Aziz begins a long story. He tells her that there is an old legend in the kingdom. A very long time ago, the kingdom suffered a long drought for unknown reasons, and everything dried up. It is said that the streets were filled with sadness due to the epidemic. At the time when all sounds of life were extinguished, the water goddess who protects the kingdom took pity on them. She drew forth water with her power and saved everything in the kingdom. All the people wanted her to stay, but this was a wish that could not be fulfilled. Before she left, she promised one thing. When Venus rises the brightest, the incarnation of a goddess with a beautiful soul would come down to them. She would save the one who would become the greatest sultan. The priest explains that this incarnation appears in the form of a cat and that he has brought her here for that purpose. In response, she gives him a dirty look, and he observes that she has some trust issues. Say he finds it strange that the goddess's incarnation is a cat. Besides, isn't a beautiful soul supposed to resemble nuns and princesses? Whether in her previous life or now, she that this description is far from her. Because what's the point of the soul anyway? It's only given to main characters. She can't even dream of being a main character. In her past life, she was someone whose only goal was to survive each day, so there's definitely no fairy tale like story for her. As these thoughts run through her mind, little teardrops fall from her cute cat eyes. The priest notices and apologizes for discussing something too heavy. He reveals that although he has divine eyes and can recognize the cat, it is difficult to read a cat's mind. He tells her not to cry and reaches to wipe the tears. This brings some form of comfort to her. Being comforted by a stranger reminds her of when she first saw her cat, Maru. He approached her warmly even when she first saw him. As the priest continues petting her warmly, he asks if she trusts him a little. For a moment, she seems to consider it, then decides against it. She waves her paws in the air to show her disapproval, and then later feels embarrassed. Afterward, she remembers that she has been starving all day, and she doesn't know what to do. The priest seems to read her mind, says that he should have given her something to fill her stomach first. He tells her to wait a moment, and she rises in expectation. Some maids set up a table, and she's urged to eat as much as she likes. In amazement, she watches as different option of food is set down in front of her. Without further delay, she digs in. The priest watches her and admits that if he had known she would like it this much, he would have given it to her sooner. He calls the maids to bring some more as say he continues to dig in hungrily. She thinks to herself that she still doesn't believe in prophecies and all that, but if they would treat her this much because they believe she is the prophecy cat, then she has made up her mind. Rather than returning to the streets and starving, she will sit here comfortably. She smiles in satisfaction as she imagines future wealth and enjoyment to come. Now that things have come to this, she's ready to play the role of the Cat of Prophecy. After a while, Mr. Aziz starts up the conversation again. He reveals that regarding the prophecy he mentioned earlier, there's a secret that only a few know. And if it's true, say he can turn back into a human. He adds that this is only possible if she is willing to follow along. The news halts her in her tracks, and she stops eating for a moment. To her, if such a thing exists, the priest should have said it earlier. She clutches his arm with one hand, thinking that even if she won't be able to go back to the world she lived in before, 
returning to human form would be enough. The priest tells her to calm down and that he will tell her everything after the meal. He says it's still in the experimental stage, but it's worth a try. He asks her what she thinks about it, and she gives him a grateful look. All she can think about is whether it's time for her to choose between hot and cold food and how much she would love to kiss him if she were human. The priest seems to take this as a good answer, stating that he will take her cheerfulness as a positive sign. Finally, he announces that it's time to get ready, and she looks at him confused. Get ready? Ready for what? In the next scene, the question is answered as we see Sehi fighting for her life in a bathtub. She inwardly wails after discovering what getting ready means. The maids tell her to hang in there as they notice that she doesn't seem to like the bath. She tries to tolerate it too, but still doesn't like it. She decides to blame Mr. Aziz, noting that he is not trustworthy. After a chaotic bath, she is wrapped up in a warm towel, and the priest receives her. He tells her that he loves her new look. But all she can think about is that she never knew a bath could be so difficult. She secretly apologizes to her cat in her old life for how she had constantly bathed him. Finally, the priest announces that the time has come. He tells her he needs to do something first, so he presents a choker, which he says is a special item made by himself. He tells her to keep wearing it until he tells her otherwise. She thinks to herself that it's just like a bell on a cat's neck and a poor choice, and the priest notifies her that he can clearly see what she is thinking. He explains that the bell, although annoying as it seems, is something that he hopes she will keep with her. He says there is something special about it. A worker interrupts their conversation, and Mr. Aziz turns to ask the man if he has finished his work successfully. The worker replies affirmatively, stating that he has completed all the preparations as ordered. The priest then turns to Sehi and tells her it's time to go back to being human. Her eyes glaze over with happy tears because she finally believes he is a man who keeps his word. Apart from living in a palace like this, getting to be human again is an opportunity she doesn't want to miss. She'd be a fool otherwise. As they approach a room, she raises her paws in anticipation and tells herself she's ready to do anything to become human. However, the moment they step in, her expectations drop drastically. She looks around in disbelief at the gloomy room and notices a person lying across the bed. The priest notices her discomfort due to the unfamiliar atmosphere and tells her it's no big deal, so she shouldn't worry. He explains that the person on the bed is asleep due to sleeping pills. This information makes her even more uncomfortable, and she tags it as quite a big deal. As the priest lowers her to the bed, he announces that her first task to becoming human is to wake the sleeping prince with a kiss. She looks up at him in horror and disbelief. At this moment, all she can think about is a circus performance with Mr. Aziz at the head. She keeps waiting for him to call it what it is, a joke. And it soon becomes clear to her that this is the real thing. This discovery prompts her to dash away and escape, but Mr. Aziz grabs her. He tries to calm her down and comments that she's quite agile for a prophecy cat. When she seems a bit stable, he asks if she feels the strange curse energy spreading throughout the room. She thinks in annoyance that it's just a big gloomy room that is dark and bloody, so it gives her the creeps. She wonders what kind of curse makes a person feel like this, or a cat in her case. The priest seems to read her mind and explains that it is the room of the second prince, Solomon. Though he's the second prince, he is the real deal and the heir to the throne. That's why everyone is treating him as the next sultan. He further explains that Solomon suffers from some kind of curse. Moreover, he confesses that he had no idea what was going on, but had been hoping that the reincarnation of Ishtar would be the key. He's been wondering who could save the prince, but now he's sure that say he can. She looks at him in horror, wondering if he's going to make her kiss the prince while she's a cat. The priest seems to read her mind again and replies that if someone fit to be sultan comes in contact with the incarnation of Ishtar, it can turn into a human. He urges her to give it a try because a kiss between the incarnation of Ishtar and the future sultan is all it takes. Our female lead is disappointed. Everything the priest believes is based on superstition. Eventually, Mr. Aziz tells her that it's time for her to get familiar with the prince 
and that he'll be taking his leave. Thanks to the sleeping pills, the prince is out like a light. He assures her that he'll be outside, so she doesn't have to worry about anyone barging in. He wishes her good luck and takes his leave. She tries to beg him to hold on and not to leave her hanging, but all that comes out is a meow. She slaps her face in disappointment and embarrassment and tells herself that she doesn't care how much she wants to be human. It's outrageous to kiss someone she has never met before. However, she decides to take a look at the sleeping man, and she rethinks her decision because he is extremely stunning. He looks like an angel. She quickly snaps out of it and decides that she has to go for it while the prince is out cold. His face is so handsome that it would make anyone weaken the knees. She reminds herself that she has got to kiss him to turn human, and as a cat, she can get a kiss that she would never even get as a human. She mentally tries to weigh the scale of her pride versus being human, and becoming human wins. Finally, she looks down at him and breaks out in a cold sweat. She tells herself she just has to close her eyes and do it once she feels him. She leans forward and tries to give him a kiss, but at the last moment, she chickens out. Likewise, she finds that she can't do this and decides she should give it a try somewhere else first. Not only that, but she explores different parts of his body, setting out to find the perfect place to kiss, and then she finally settles on his chest. Furthermore, she decides this is it, this is the only way. It won't happen if she waits all night, she has to do it now. Time to put her pride aside. Now, she leans forward and gives him a kiss on the lips. As she realizes what she has just done, she puts a paw to her face and blushes. She feels really embarrassed in her cat form and thinks to herself that if this doesn't work, the priest is going to dump her. Suddenly, her heart begins to race and she feels dizzy and sick. She stumbles to the edge of the bed as she tries to find a way out the door to call for the priest's help. She gets tangled up in a red drape as she tries to go for help. A moment later, we see Suleiman waking up. He doesn't seem to remember dozing off and wonders when he nodded off. Usually he feels bummed and beat up when he wakes up, but he feels lighter than air today. As he touches his face, his hand comes away wet. He wonders if a dog got to him in his sleep, but he believes there's no way an animal would be in his room. When he looks towards his mirror, he sees a strange woman draped in red with her back to him. He wonders who she is, then suddenly recognizes the danger of an intruder. He begins to suspect that she might be an assassin. However, when he thinks about it, he realizes that an assassin would be ruthless in order to achieve her goal. He doesn't see any signs of hostility or any intention to attack from her. So she must be more than just an assassin. He remembers how the nobles constantly bother him to build a harem and suspects that this might be their doing. Those high-ranking council members are always sending women his way, and it really frustrates him. He decides to take this opportunity to make sure they never do it again. He plans to kick this new woman out this time, no matter what. With that in mind, he draws his sword and approaches her, commending her on her bravery for entering his room alone. This leads us back to the first half of the story. Now we return to the awkward situation in the room as Prince Solomon wonders what he should do in this instance. The only sound that had come out of the woman's mouth was that of a cat, and it doesn't make any sense. He begins to feel dizzy as different thoughts race through his mind. He doesn't know if he should believe that she doesn't know anything if she is truly innocent, or what he is supposed to do with her. Say he feels like it's her chance to do something quickly. She tries to come up with a defense, but no human language comes out at all. The second prince tells her that even if she's not involved, it doesn't change the fact that she entered the royal bedroom without permission, and he has no choice but to hold her responsible. He tells her it would be better to answer correctly without joking. She panics, thinking to herself that it's not that she doesn't want to speak, but that she cannot. She doesn't even know how long she can stay like this in her human form. Suddenly, an idea occurs to her, and she clutches her chest and falls forward. She holds her chest in pain and scrunches up her face. The prince rushes forward and asks what has happened to her. He tells her to get up, then turns around to call for help. 
when he returns to check on her, he sees that the room is filled with some kind of smoke, and by the time it clears, he realizes that she's gone. The only thing left is the red drape. It confuses him as he wonders what happened and who the woman was. Guards rush into the room after seeing suspicious smoke arising from the prince's room. They come in to check if there is a fire or an intruder and hurriedly ask him if he's okay. By this time, Sehi has returned to her cat form and successfully makes it out the door, breaking into a sweat. As she listens to the guards ponder about an intruder, she is glad that nobody saw her. She wonders why she should struggle to become a human being in such a short period of time. A hand grabs her from behind, happy to see her, but she doesn't seem thrilled to see him. It's the priest. He tells her that they are lucky that nobody seemed to notice, and she bites his thumb angrily. She is upset that he doesn't know what happened to her because of him. But he takes it in good spirits. He playfully says there was some noise and tells her they need to get out quickly before something else happens. As they walk away, he asks her how her meeting with the prince went and if she turned into a human, as the legend says. Inwardly, she thinks to herself that she doesn't want to tell the priest about it, so she shakes her head in the negative, surprising him. Miaziz says it is strange because he is sure that would be the right way to make her transform into a human. She looks away guilty, determined not to meet his eyes. On a lighter note, he says they can't judge since it's the first try and that he looks forward to the next time. He pats her head for the good work and tells her to go to sleep because she seems tired. She still has lots to ask, but in her cat state, there is little she can do. As she drifts off to sleep, she hears the priest's soothing voice thanking her. The next day, she is in his arms once again. As he walks around with her, she notices that the palace is quieter today compared to yesterday. She begins to think that no matter how high Mr. Aziz's status is, it must be difficult to walk around with a cat at a time like this. He speaks to her as he walks, saying that they are about to attend a simple meeting and she should feel comfortable. However, her mind is elsewhere, as she wonders what the highest-ranking person in the palace would probably look like. Eventually, the priest comes to a stop at a room and addresses the person in front of him. Sehi looks up at the person in wonder, and Mr. Aziz explains that the person before them is the highest and brightest being in the country. She is the great Queen Harem. The queen rises from her lazy, slouching position and exchanges pleasantries with the priest. He shows her the cat and presents it as the reincarnation of Ishtar. The powerful woman leans forward to pull and prod for closer inspection. Finally, she concludes that from the bright eyes to the color of the fur, the cat is just like the legend. Then she moves on to business and turns to the priest, saying they can talk about the rest. Harem confesses that she doesn't know if the man is mad because she put a girl in there for him, and the priest laughs, but quickly covers it up with a fake cough. In reply, she tells him that laughing at the sultan's words is punishable by death. He replies that he is not afraid of that, then he proceeds to reveal that the cat in his hand understands everything. He urges the queen to speak calmly, even if she is joking, and she bursts out into laughter. She asks if she can take the cat instead of her son, and the priest says it's impossible because the cat is someone whom heaven has given to the prince. Hurem responds that sending the promised cat to such a cruel man would be a waste. At this point, Sehi has fallen into a state of confusion as she tries to make sense of the conversation. She wonders who the man and son is. After taking a closer look at the queen's face, she feels like she has seen it somewhere. At that moment, Hurem raises her head to address a newcomer, saying that it sounds scary to come just as they are speaking about him. A gruff voice replies, asking what they were saying about him while he wasn't there. Sehi turns around only to discover that the son the queen was talking about is none other but Prince Solomon. The queen says hello to her son, pointing out that it's always difficult for him to see her. She offers him a cup of tea, and he replies that the tasks the sultan has assigned to him are too many. In response, she says there's nothing she can do for him, and he says he has given up all his expectations after this work rained down on him. Noticing the ball of fur on the table for the first time, he asks his mother why it is hiding there. 
desperately, say he prays in her mind that the second prince doesn't see her because she would rather not meet him. The queen tells him that calling a cute creature like that a lump of fur is really an exaggeration. Suddenly, our female lead remembers that what Solomon saw was her in her human form, so there's no need to worry about what happened yesterday. She reveals herself boldly, and it confuses him that the cat is suddenly coming out, smiling suspiciously. He tells his mother that he has a question before he accepts her invitation. He asks her if she heard about the little commotion that happened in his room last night, and she says the Chamberlain had come to her with a serious look on his face. Likewise, he proceeds to mention to her that a woman had entered his room last night, and Sehi feigns ignorance as she licks her fur. Solomon asks his mother if she knows anything about it, and she seems to be thinking of something else. She teases him about a woman being in his room, and he turns red at her suggestive words. Finally, she apologizes, saying she knows absolutely nothing about it. He replies that he understands and asks if she intends to say anything else. He points out that it is uncommon for a priest to be invited to drink tea, so there must be something he wants to say. Harem smiles and says her son is right, and the priest has a really interesting story. She gestures to the cat, whom Solomon had previously called a lump of fur, and tells him that she wants him to take the cat into his suite formally, so he shouldn't be rude to her. Every member of the royal family must have a cat of their own anyway. She explains that the cat before them was hardly found, and that it is the promised cat, so it will be of great help to the prince as well. He clenches his fist in anger and says that he might be losing his morals when he says this, but he couldn't care about things like the legend of the promised cat. Mr. Aziz says that's not the only reason the prince will be taking the cat. He points out that the story and what it contains is that the sultan was always known for the presence of the promised cat at his side. He says that if the prince keeps this cat by his side, there will be no one who objects to him assuming the caliphate. Solomon replies that he can prove his position with his strength, and the priest asks him if his body doesn't feel lighter than before. The second prince takes a moment to pause as if he feels his body. He agrees that it is true and asks the priest how he knows about it. Mr. Aziz explains that he knows because last night the cat had been in Solomon's room for some time. He adds that it is one of the cat's wondrous abilities and... Furthermore, he says he is confident that if the cat stays by the prince's side, she would help him in many ways. This time, Solomon doesn't object. A few hours later, say he becomes bored. She feels confused about why she was taken to a place where she is supposed to be cared for, only to be neglected. Instead of the prince serving her and addressing her needs, he has neglected her since the day he took her, without even glancing at her once. This makes her feel miserable and alone, and she wonders just when she'll be able to return to her human form. If her body changed because of that kiss, she's ready to repeat what she did. She decides she's going to get closer to him and make sure she gives it a try. Suddenly, a face pops up close to her head, gazing at her in amazement. It makes her spring up in surprise. Luckily, it is just one of the maids. The young lady says she saw our cat playing alone and couldn't stop herself. She expresses disbelief that they brought a cat like this to a depressing place. This maid's name is Arin. She sits next to our female lead and explains that her older brother is always busy, so she can't see him. In such a short time, she has been unable to find people her age. She leans a bit closer and tells Sehi that she sees her as a friend. These are the words the maid says on their first meeting. Our female lead decides that since the maid is younger than her, she will take her as a younger sister. In the following days, Arin takes good care of Sehi, and her face radiates brilliance whenever she is happy. They bother have similar personalities, and it causes our female lead to worry. One day, Arin comes over, knowing that Sehi would be bored, and brings along a game. Despite being an adult in the body of a cat, the little game catches her attention, and she has so much fun playing with it alongside the maid. After playing to her full, she yawns in exhaustion and falls asleep. Moments later, Solomon returns and goes straight to bed. When Sehi wakes up, she wonders when she dozed off and notices that the second prince has returned. She feels a sudden terrible energy and is pretty sure 
There was nothing like this during the day. It is more intense than before, a sensation that tingles her body. She wonders if the prince is suffering from some type of illness. She moves towards him to try to wake him up and sees him groaning in pain. Furthermore, she becomes worried about his pale skin and recalls the priest's words, saying that Solomon has been suffering since his childhood and was born with bad omens scattered around him. Our female lead moves closer to try to wake him up, as worry sets in. He may not be a good person, but she feels she can't let him die because that would be an awful fate. She pounds her paws on his chest, inwardly commanding the black atmosphere and strange black tendrils to stay away from him. As she hits his chest, a bright light appears and envelops the entire room. In surprise, she hurriedly takes her paws off his chest and pauses for a moment, confused. She wonders what she has just done and decides to try it again. After she repeats the motion, she realizes that she just suppressed the curse around him as black smoke tendrils drift away. She also notices that his condition has stabilized just by being close to her. She thinks about how this strange curse is the reason behind his pain, and a sudden heavy feeling overcomes her. Before she knows what's happening, she falls on her back and passes out. The next morning, the Solomon wakes up to find that the pain in his chest is gone. He turns and sees the promised cat curled up beside him, and he smiles. Just as the priest had said, the cat helped ease his pain. He admits that he never thought he would find someone who could help him and appreciates that the cat has been a great aid. He then rubs her head in appreciation. Meanwhile, Sehi is in the middle of a weird dream. In this dream, a well-cooked fish is urging her to eat him. She compliments the fish for being a gentleman and promises to fulfill his wish by eating him immediately. So, she bites into it hard. However, the fish is surprisingly tough and tastes salty. When she opens her eyes, the first thing she sees is the second prince, and she jumps back in surprise. He asks her what is going on with her and tells her there is no need to panic. He then tells her how she was sleeping in his arms and biting him and asks if she's going to pretend she hadn't realized. She keeps her distance, wondering if she really did what he said. Solomon tells her that no one but her is permitted to do this, informing her that she is his only cat. He leans forward to scratch her ears affectionately. It surprises her as his behavior has changed completely. The next day, Aaron shows up with a new surprise, a pretty blue dress. She tells her cat friend that she bought the dress as soon as she got paid. However, Sehi feels that the dress looks uncomfortable and wonders if she should wear it. The excited maid explains that the inauguration ceremony of the governor general is approaching and they need to appear noble and pretty. Today, our female lead realizes for the first time that Arin talks to her in belief that she understands what she is saying. Later on, the young maid decides it's time to try on the outfit. A few minutes later, she has our cat looking gorgeous. And she coos in admiration at how well the dress fits. Aaron suddenly realizes that her cat friend has never worn clothes, so she feels it would be a nice idea to take her out of the room in the pretty new dress to a beautiful place. When they get outside, the young maid shows our cat a secret place where she goes to hide whenever she gets scolded. It makes her happy because she has really wanted to show it to somebody. She puts Sehi down on a rock and tells her to wait a moment while she goes to make a wreath. Absently, our female lead wonders what Aaron is talking about. As she looks around, admiring the scenery, she sees a bird in a bush. Her cat instincts tell her to hunt it, so she dashes after it, trying to catch it. The bird flies up to a tree branch and seems to be teasing her. This angers her and makes her more determined to catch it. With three furious leaps, she bounds from the ground to the branch to grab the bird, but it flies away. At that moment, she realizes her mistake as she starts falling backward. She remembers a similar experience when she was caught and put in a cage, so she closes her eyes and prepares for the impact of her fall. However, she doesn't feel the pain. When she opens her eyes, she's surprised to see she is still alive. She looks up into an unfamiliar face, and it's a man who says he must be lucky because a cute cat has fallen into his arms. Say, he doesn't seem to hear a word he says because right now, a very breathtakingly beautiful man has just appeared out of thin air. 
The wonderful view of his face makes her blush even in her cat form, and the man chuckles silently to himself. He says it's the first time he has seen a cat like this. He compliments her unusual eye color and tells her she looks pretty. This actually pleases her deeply. She can't believe her luck at finding another handsome man in the palace. Unlike the second prince, who has a frightening and dangerous atmosphere, this man gives the air of a prince riding a white horse, which makes her delighted. He puts her down, and she tells herself she can't help being attracted to this handsome man, even though the second prince is also very handsome. The man seems to notice the choker around her neck and confirms that she is part of the sultan's harem. He asks why she is alone here and if she ran away. He tells her it must be dangerous outside for a kitten like her, and she remembers her bad experiences outside in the real world. The beautiful man smiles and asks if she understands him. He then suggests it might be better for her to run free, as he seems not to be the only one frustrated in the palace. At this, she wonders what she should do in such a situation and notices some red flowers in a bush. She grabs one for him and tries to cheer him up, but he picks it out of her mouth and tells her she can't eat poisonous plants. She feels misunderstood and wishes she could express herself because she was trying to show him something to make him feel better. He attempts to understand her expressions and asks if she likes flowers. It frustrates her even more because he doesn't understand what is really going on in her mind. He tells her again not to eat the flower and presents her with another one. It's a flower decoration made of fabric. He says it's a gift because if she eats something real, she could get sick. Then he attaches it to her dress and tells her it looks good on her. Sehi is genuinely touched because this is her first gift of flowers in her life given to her by such a handsome man. A voice calling out for a cat interrupts them, and it turns out to be Aaron. She leans over, catching her breath from running around, and announces that it's time to go back inside. The handsome stranger turns to stare at the maid with a puzzled expression, and she quickly straightens up when she recognizes the man before her. She addresses him as Prince Theron and apologizes for not realizing earlier. The prince stands up and says it's okay. Then he explains how he thought the cat had escaped. He returns Sehi to her maid and says he's glad he got to have such a cute companion for a short while. He pats her on the head and says he hopes to see her again. Then he waves goodbye as he leaves. Aaron waves in response and gushes about how handsome he is, and our female lead meows in agreement. Her maid explains that Prince Theron is a very kind person. She admits that at first, she fell in love with his nice appearance like everyone else and wanted to be assigned to his palace instead of Solomon's. She says the second prince is great, but she got a little scared working with him. Sehi inwardly agrees because the first time she saw him, she thought he was very cold, although he is also very handsome. She quickly shakes her head to clear her thoughts, and Aaron looks at her in confusion. She suddenly notices the flower attached to the dress and asks if it was from Prince Theron. In reply, Sehi meows and turns around to show it off happily. The maid agrees that it's adorable, but says that in the language of flowers, this flower means something different. However, she doesn't bother to explain further. Back indoors, our promised cat is lazing about, feeling exhausted. She senses the terrifying presence of the second prince and wonders why he is looking at her like that. In order to ignore him, she turns away and licks her paws. Unfortunately, he doesn't give up and continues to stare. He finally approaches and leans down for a closer inspection, and she wonders why he is looking at her that way. He comments that the promised cat seems well-fed now compared to how thin she was very thin when she arrived. This outrages Sehi, and she wonders if she has been eating too much. Solomon picks her up, telling her that the priest instructed him to stay close to her. He says that since his work isn't finished yet, she will have to wait quietly by his desk. He sets her down closer to him, but she only feels annoyed by his gestures. The second prince does a double take and leans forward again, but all she gives him is a disgusted look. He picks up the flower attached to her collar and says that the decoration is in the way and looks uncomfortable. She growls at him angrily because it is a gift from a handsome man. As an explanation, 
Solomon says that although the flower looks like a simple decoration, it means nothing. He claims he doesn't know who gave it to her, but says it smells bad, then he crushes it in his hands. Say he watches him in disbelief as she wonders why he is acting this way. That one flower had actually meant a lot to her. She becomes sad, realizing that people seem to worship her only because she is believed to be the goddess's reincarnation. She wonders if it is only because she can help him with the curse, and if her only value as the promised cat is why she is kept around. Eventually, she looks out the window, wondering how long this situation will continue. Later that night, Prince Solomon complains that she is eating too much for someone who is useless. He says her whole body is fat, and she growls at him in anger, wishing she could explain that it's not fat but her fur. She tries to show him that it's all muscle and fur and growls angrily. She hits him with her paw as hard as she can in defiance, surprising him. He asks if she is no longer interested in his forearm but now in his chest, then calls her a perverted cat. She screams internally and recoils in horror. The next day, Aaron arrives again and excitedly shows off a box of jewelry to her cat friend, chatting eagerly. However, our female lead feels exhausted and wonders how the maid can speak with her eyes open all morning. The young maid picks her up and swings her around, saying that the governor's inauguration is coming up and they have some gifts to check out together. Secretly, our female lead is happy to see Aaron so excited. As they go through the gifts, the young maid comments that they are all good, but suggests moving the items they aren't using right now. She tells Sehi to wait for a moment. Our female lead lets out a sad meow, wanting to help somehow and thinking of moving some accessories. A voice calls out to her, and she turns to see Prince Theron. He is happy to see her again. He tells her it is said that the Sultan's favorite cats don't go out, and gives her a rub behind the ears. Likewise, he comments that seeing her alone today makes him feel that the people around might not know the charm of a cat. Furthermore, he picks her up and snuggles her, admitting that he was worried she might be crying when he wasn't around. A voice interrupts them, coldly telling Theron to put down the cat. It is his brother, Solomon. Theron greets him, saying it has been a while, but the second prince's face turns sour. Our female lead wonders why he is angry again, and Solomon repeats his demand for Theron to put down the cat. Theron replies that he's just playing with the cat. And when the second prince insists he take his hands off her, Theron asks if he is in a position to give orders. At this, our female lead realizes they are brothers who seem extremely diverse. Solomon explains that he has such authority because the cat in his brother's arms is his. This news surprises Theron, who says he had no idea about it. He explains that he has met the cat before, and they are excellent friends, so he was happy to see her. Initially, he thought she had run away because she didn't like her owner. Solomon then tells his brother that the cat is the one from the legend. He takes back his cat and mentions to Theron that he doesn't understand the significance, that this is a cat everyone covets. After successfully recovering his cat, Solomon mentions that they may never see each other again after the inauguration, so it's better not to worry about misunderstandings. However, Theron says he will be staying in the capital for a while after the inauguration. As the second prince hears this, he becomes angry, forgetting he's holding the cat, and he clenches his fist, squishing her head. He asks Theron if he was the one who gave the cat the flower the previous day. Theron admits he was and says it was a little gift, which further angers Solomon. Solomon asks if his brother doesn't realize what that flower meant. Theron replies that although the language of the flower symbolizes pitiful love, it is just an ornament. However, the second prince argues that Theron had said such when he was young. The legend about that flower tells the story of a person blessed by the goddess who is misunderstood because someone else is in love with a woman and eventually dies. Prince Theron laughs, saying he didn't know his brother was concerned about such things. Solomon says he doesn't see the point of giving such an unfortunate decoration and squishes the cat's head even more. He tells his brother that he will be watching him during his stay in the capital until he finishes his treatment and returns to his territory. With that, he turns and walks away. Our female lead turns to give Theron a curious look, 
and he waves to her with a smile on his face. As her eyes brighten, she returns the wave. Theron's expression changes as he thinks to himself that he will take anything that belongs to Solomon, including his second brother's cat. The drama is just getting started. Want us to continue? Comment cat below. Also, please like, share, and subscribe. Until next time, ciao!